The Music is Life podcast has our own merch now over on tpublic.com. Click the link below in the video description. Looking for some new threads? We got t-shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, crew neck sweatshirts, tank tops, baseball tees, and also clothes for kids and onesies for your little infant metalheads. Don't want clothes but love the Java? We got you covered with coffee mugs and travel mugs. Need protection for your electronics? We've also got phone and laptop cases. We've got everything you're looking for at the tpublic.com Music is Life podcast store. Use my link below for fast service. Thanks for your support. TerraNut is proud to offer you a natural nut bar chock full of healthy fats, minerals, and protein that meet your demands. Go to their website, www.terranut.com. You can order from them directly and they will ship it to you. Use my coupon code LUMAVS and you will get a 25% discount on your first order. TerraNut Superfood Snacks, www.terranut.com. Don't forget to use coupon code LUMAVS at checkout. Fuel your life. Looking for some new podcasts to listen to? Well, look no further than the Ratsaw Review Network. Ratsaw Review is taking over the podcast world with plenty of shows to choose from within their network of entertaining programming, including the flagship show, Ratsaw Review, with Wayne Noon, Greg Noggle, and Lou Mavs, as well as occasional co-hosts Manny Mejias and James Lilquist. We also have the official Ratsaw Review spin-off, such as Album vs. Album, Screams from the Grave, where we discuss beloved yet forgotten hard rock and metal albums of the past, and a King Diamond podcast called This Broadcast Belongs to Them. We've also got Old Man Metal's Music, the Right Opinion with Harrison Bergeron. Beyond Bushido, a podcast dedicated to pro wrestling and MMA with James Lilquist and Eric Adams. No relation to the guy from Manowar or the mayor of New York City. The Vieira Ball with Ralph Vieira. Schmackamagab! Schmackamagab to you too, Ralph. The Team Otoki podcast featuring Stradivarius and Avalon founding member Team Otoki. The BS Sessions with Mark and Jerry. Just the Cheese, Please, a podcast dedicated to cheesy films of the 1980s with Tara J and Adam. The Friday Night Party with the great Harry Barnett and Evie. And the Music is Live podcast with Lou Mavs. The Ratsaw Review Network is your go-to one-stop shop for the best podcasts out there today. Go to RatsawReview.com for more info. And to find out where you can find, follow, subscribe, and comment on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and all streaming platforms. The Ratsaw Review Network. We're taking over. Ladies and gentlemen, how do? We are ready and waiting for you now. If it's a fight that you dare see, we've acquired our strength through pain. No more are we pathetic and we You are the reason why we claim that we've all become this way. And I regret the prison that I created for myself. Who can it be? Who makes us cry? Who won't save us from ourselves? I close my eyes and then I pray that revenge can be as sweet as it sounds. We are the rebels that fall from me. documentary a few years back and it was about the end of the video store era and the decline of physical media the last blockbuster video in the united states it opened up a can of worms that i think resonates throughout the history of film filmmaking is a freedom of speech issue and you have very few people who will buck that system the ambition is what matters at the heart is there and films have been censored throughout history in various ways that film which was his first film destroyed his career and controversy is really what makes a movie survive there was no streaming service that would even stream us. They just decided to start pulling content. We're not in control of our destinies, they are. All the rules that prevent monopoly and encourage competition have gone away. You should be able to, you should be able to turn a profit. You, you did. Someone stole it. <laughs> Somewhere along the 120 year plus history of film, 
people realized that movies had the ability to sculpt society in a way that was even more potent than the written word, and people have been trying to control it ever since. Music is Live podcast. This is your host, Lou Mavs. Check out everything you need to know about the show over at musicislivepodcast.com. Ladies and gentlemen, in my hands, I hold a Blu-ray copy of VHS Massacre 2, a sequel to the original VHS Massacre released in 2016 from Troma and directed by Thomas Edward Seymour and Kenneth Powell. Thomas also hosts a podcast called VHS Massacres available on all streaming platforms. The first film discusses the decline of physical media. The sequel discusses the difficulty of independent content creators distributing their films for the masses to consume. Talking points such as the monopolization of movie theater chains by the major communication conglomerates, the end of on the pop video rental stores and net neutrality are brought up. They also interview Joe Bob Briggs in one of his final interviews prior to the premiere of Shutter's The Last Drive-In, cult film queen Debbie Rashawn, and Lloyd Kaufman, the president of Troma Films, which is the longest running independent film studio. If you want to open up your perspective on genre films and do your due diligence to seek films that you can't find on Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, or Disney Plus, I seriously recommend this film. This film is available on Amazon or you can go to Troma's online store over over at www.troma.com. As for me, I give this film five out of five horns. And today, I'm proud to say that I have on my podcast the director for VHS Massacre 2, Mr. Thomas Edward Seymour. Hey, thanks so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Now, are you actually at Kim's video right now, or is that just yeah, the back? <laughs> in front of Kim's? I think Kim's is probably a bank now or something, you know? Of course they are. Apple Bank or some <laughs> random bank no one's ever heard of. I tell you, walking into Kim's as a teenager in the 90s and seeing the genre films that I ended up becoming a sycophant for is pretty much what I'll say. You know, films by Lucio Fulci, films by Dario Argento. Films by Lloyd Kaufman. I mean, to me, being a teenager in the 90s was the best time to grow up because you kind of had like the remainder of things from the 80s that were still good. And you had this awesome exposure to alternative cinema that was finally available for people to buy and watch in their own home. And I'm not talking the creepy stuff. I'm talking the good stuff, people. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I mean, everything is sort of fast and easy now. But, I, you know, I think back of how little information, you know, pre-internet, how you'd walk into a video store and... There was a mystery of, a, you know, you maybe you see a, a cover of a VHS, you know, maybe it was Dead Pit or something, and you're, you're fascinated. You know nothing about that film except what you could read on the back, you know. It stoked the imagination in a way that I don't think you can get now because you can just look up everything about everything, you know, and have it at your fingertips. Yeah. One good thing, aside from the back of the covers that had great stuff written out explaining what the film was about, the covers were always to die for. I mean, I think of those big box covers from the 80s, such as The Beyond, or as it was released in the United States, The Seven Doors of Death. The box was cool, but the film was even cooler. You were the last great marketing geniuses of our time. Thank you very much, whoever drew all those big box covers. But you were all in, too, you know, when you picked the film it was your pick for the night and you go home and you were all in even if the movie wasn't that great you were invested and e even when you finished it there was a process to it and you got to pick it out and there was something special about it you know and a preciousness to it i am also a, a collector of physical media and i think i i think i always will be and there is some good data about how dvd and blu-rays actually having a bit of a, a surge and some of the uh, sales rather than going down every year, it seems to uh, be coming back up. And for some reason, standard DVD seems to be surging. That's interesting because I mean, I love the widescreen cinematic look. If you go to the Troma Now app, they do have the HD versions of their classic films, but they also have the SD versions in unrated format. And that's cool. But I grew up loving the movies, like going to the movies. I can remember, and I'm not sure which was the film I saw first, but it was either Ghostbusters or Gremlins. I was four years old. And let me just tell you, that made me a cinephile to a point where I was looking for not just bigger, but 
in general, just better, seeing what else was out there, seeing what people could do on a really good budget by telling a good story, but people who could also tell a great story on a minuscule budget. And I think this is why I fell in love with genre films and exploitation films. I really have to give it to you. I've been on a crusade to really push the idea that physical media matters. And I have to say, it, you know, not just for film, but for music, especially. And, oh, yeah. and I, I have to give you the credit because VHS Massacre revived my love for like the physical product. I went on and got the budgie box set when Burke Shelley passed away because no, I couldn't find Brett fan on any streaming media platform. So that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I have no clue if anyone watches my doc. So it, it's really wonderful to hear from you. You're like, no. Oh, I, I saw it. I liked it. It's amazing because, frankly, you put a movie out there, you're pretty isolated. You have no idea if anyone is watching this stuff, you know, so it's really good to get feedback from you, you know. Um, or if they're watching it, you don't know if they're doing this while they're watching it, not paying attention. Yeah, you have no idea. And for those listening, I was playing on the cell phone. That's what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad. I mean, you know, the movie, it was difficult to put together. The second one in particular, I really had one of my friends, James, uh, Professor James Richardson, who's in the film, can tell you how unsure I was about it, you know, halfway through showing him cuts and just so full of doubt whether this was worth putting out. And uh, so it's really, it's really wonderful to hear, uh, you know. Professor, it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, no, it's good. Keep going. You know, he was very encouraging. Yeah. Artistically, you know, you, you just have to keep going with what you're doing, you know. And Absolutely. Another thing that gravitated me towards you was because when I was watching the first film, there was a certain neighborhood in it that I recognized. And that was Astoria, Queens, which is where uh, I'm born and bred. Excellent. Yeah. PS, PS70, IS10, Bryan High School. That's all me. Oh, wow. So that's that's right over there, right? Um, is that near, um, I'm trying to think, it's okay, yeah, right near the high school. Very so, cool. So PS70 is on 43rd between 30th and Newtown Road, I want to say. Okay. And PS10 is on 30th between 45th and 46th Street. Bryant is on 30th between 48th and 49th Street, right across the street from the Woodside Projects, oh, where okay. we smelled yes. plenty of Sensamia growing up, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it was good times. Yeah, I, I guess about... 14 years I lived in various apartments around Astoria. And now I'm in Jackson Heights, not that far away. So now I'm over there, been there for a couple of years. So that's pretty cool. But I love Astoria. I miss it. You know, I, I should go there more often, you know. Well, as I told John Brennan, I recommend Steinway Pizza. I don't know if you're vegan or not. Um, no, no, no. OK, but, then I really recommend Steinway Pizza on Steinway Street between 31st and Broadway. Best pizza in Astoria. Sorry to shame everybody else, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what I love about the first documentary was that as a physical media collector, it spoke to me. There's so much great music and film out there to be consumed. And it pains me that a lot of this stuff is not available for consumers to get it unless they buy a physical copy, which is either out of print or overpriced. What was the impetus for creating VHS Massacre 2? Since instead of solely discussing physical media, it also discusses the inability for independent content creators to find distribution for their product. I think it was because at the end of the first one, it left the door open for this um, hope, this hope for streaming, like that streaming could somehow save the independent filmmaker if treated fairly. Basically, a few years had gone by and not only were the streaming deals getting worse and worse on places like Prime or even YouTube, this censorship started to creep in, I think possibly initially with good intentions where a platform like Prime didn't want to have too many crazy, violent movies with nudity and gore and stuff like that to find in Prime. But what they ended up doing was deleting uh, thousands of low budget independent films. Like it was mostly micro budget stuff that got deleted. And in some cases they were deleting whole catalogs from independent distributors like Maverick Entertainment, like MVD and Troma and I've been, what was the other guy's name? Full Moon? Tempe, Tempe Video. Oh, Tempe, okay. Uh, well, the Full Moon yeah. became Tempe, correct? I think Tempe was J.R. Bookwalter's spinoff. I so see. He, he was a Full Moon guy and I think he created Tempe. I think mm -hmm. that's how it went. So it's like not only were the money deals bad, but there was this weird censorship. I think Joe Bob Briggs recently talked about it, a censorship through omission, meaning that some of these weirder movies just, you know, without anyone noticing, drop off the streaming sites and then they just disappear. It just was starting to freak me out 
especially because I, you know, I like you like the exploitation films and genre films and all that stuff. And there was these weird double standards where like you could watch Human Centipede, but like you couldn't watch Debbie Roshan's film, Model Hunger, you know, so it, it got to these places of total absurdity and unevenness and unfairness. And I think that's the thing that you want to try to fight against at least, you know, at least give us a shot. We were talking about Professor James Richardson. I remember one of the key things that he said that stuck out to me was to the avail of the last blockbuster in Oregon. He said that, I think it was something to the avail of, he hopes they die a slow death <laughs> or something to that avail. Uh, yeah. Professor, if you're watching this, if I minced your words, I apologize. Yeah, I don't think I don't think he, he, he cares. I, but I can fill in one or two of the blanks in regard to his particular uh, frustration with Blockbuster. And he said this in a Q&A, so it was somewhat public. He's a martial arts guy. Many years ago, it was him and some of the guys from his dojo went into a Blockbuster. They went up to like Yonkers, I think, and they were just looking for martial arts films. They're looking for... So like the Jim heard. Kelly film? Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, they, he had heard that, you know, Yonkers had a good selection of stuff that might not have had uh, in the Manhattan stores. And he went up there and they immediately called the police on he and all of his friends. And he didn't, he was literally, he had his membership card. He was trying to rent the videos and they just called the cops on him. And Oh, for the love oh. of Christ. Stupid! You're so stupid! So when he talks about how he hates Blockbuster, that's part of the stew of the thing. It's um, valid, but, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I have talked to him since. He absolutely does recognize that the last Blockbuster is an independent video store. It's owned by a family and it's not uh, it's it's not corporate because the corporate part doesn't exist. That's the some of the filling in the details of that. Thanks for clarifying that. I will say the the one blockbuster in Astoria, Queens that you highlighted, that was the blockbuster that I was going to when my mom and pop shop, CJC Video, that shop closed. They just became a gift store. That blockbuster was the blockbuster that I ended up going to when CJC closed down. I think I remember from the first film that there were two kinds of blockbusters. One that the corporations owned, so you'd get like all your Paramounts in them. And then there was the franchises that had had films from everyone. And that blockbuster, I remember, did have Dawn of the Dead. They did have Toxic Avenger. They did have Bleed with Debbie Rashawn. Yep, and I remember. I remember renting that when it came out on VHS. That's right, VHS, back in 2003. And I remember I love that film. I've been a fan of Debbie's ever since I saw her in Tromeo and Juliet. Never had the pleasure of meeting her. It would be a dream come true for me to get her on the show one day just because I love her body of work. I have She's a lot uh, I would love to talk with her about. And now I think it's a CVS. Of course it is. <laughs> Yeah, of course, it's a CVS. Yeah, that's a very good distinction you made about someone who owned a franchise the same way a private owner would own a Dunkin' Donuts franchise. In those cases, yeah, I absolutely agree. Lloyd talks about this. I don't, not in the doc, but Lloyd has talked to me about how there were these blockbusters owned by human beings that would find obscure movies and, and fill the shelves with them. So that was the best scenario with Blockbuster, you know, and I could look back and say, OK, yeah, those were the good blockbusters, you know. I definitely felt vindicated that 112 second clip on YouTube where this guy's interviewing Lloyd for the last blockbuster documentary and he has no idea who the hell Lloyd Kaufman is and Lloyd pretty much like, you know, stuck it to him. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to our viewers. Why? I'm just curious, why do I need to do that? Uh, in case we use the audio, hi, I'm Lloyd Kaufman and I'm a... You don't know f***ing anything about me, do you? I know. Oh, you, you do? I know who you are. Oh, all right. But, you know, people watch this on... Well, can't you just put the, uh, you can't put the cry in? I can't. I find it sometimes more endearing in documentaries when people say You haven't done your research. You don't know, that's... I'll find out when you start asking questions. Okay. As someone who hosts a podcast, I do my due diligence to do my research and make sure I don't ask the same questions that people must hear a million times a day. I love that when Lloyd stuck it to him, though. I do think that if you claim to know anything about genre film, horror in particular, if you claim to know anything about horror and you don't know who Lloyd Kaufman is, that's pretty bad. <laughs> pretty egregious. Agreed. You know. So we both established that we both lived in Astoria at one point. What I remember most about Astoria growing up, it was sort of like a mini Manhattan, but 
cooler because it wasn't as congested. And you had Kaufman and Silver Cup Studios as go-to locations to shoot TV and film. And I'll always be proud that Silver Cup was highlighted in the film Highlander, especially in the uh, ending fight scene. Hell yeah. The Corona area of Queens was also notorious because of the studio owned by Vince Benedetti called Adventure Studios, where some of the golden age of adult cinema was created including Uh works by directors such as Chuck Vincent and Gerard Damiano. By the way, I thought it was funny that on your Instagram, you posted a picture of the Fair Theater. That theater was adjacent to my father's old gas station slash auto shop. Oh, yeah. Is that there's still something there, right? Across the street? I don't know. (laughs) I never walked in there. On the outside, it looked like a grindhouse, but I think they were an adult film theater when I was growing up. I don't know if it's exclusively, but it's definitely foreign films. It seems to be a lot of Bollywood stuff, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of cool, actually. Because of the pandemic, I haven't sort of been brave enough to, to go in there, but I always pass by it because I, I live fairly close to there. It's just a cool looking old theater and I'm glad it's still open. I take a picture almost like uh, just happy that the lights, the marquee is still on, you know? And still has like that old school New York flair, which is pretty cool because everything is so Disney-fied today. Yeah. But I, I just thought it was funny because like, you know, my dad's auto shop was across the street from it. On the other side, you had the cozy cabin, which was a gentleman's club. And then next door to it was an adult video store. And you wonder, how did I grow up so warped? (laughs) That's so funny. I didn't know that was like a little adult franchise there. That's pretty interesting. Worst thing is being 12 years old and being inquisitive, especially in that area at that time. Astoria is now- That is classic New York though, right? That's that's classic New York. (laughs) It is, definitely is. Astoria is now also home to Troma, having moved from their original Hell's Kitchen location. People think, especially me having grown up in the era when I did, when it was cool to find out that a film like The Last Dragon was shot and Whitestone at Super Amusements Arcade where I used to go growing up, or a film like Serpico, where some of it was shot in Dittmars. That was something about Queens that always spoke to me, was that it had its culture, but its grittiness that also came across on film. What is it about Queens, New York that speaks to you? Queens, I feel like, especially in that era, was like, they could probably get away with more, I would imagine. Queens, I think, was a little more of a spacious borough. And I think maybe you could kind of come in there without permits and shoot some stuff and get away with it. I think some of that's still what I like about Queens as someone who's never had a budget to get things like permits and stuff like that. There is something about it being, I don't want to say it's more for families, but there is something about it. You know, Manhattan and Brooklyn seem to be sort of dialed up to 11 and Queens, I think about it as a little less crazy. And as a generalization, maybe the people are a little more genuine. As someone who grew up in the suburbs, I grew up in central Connecticut, which was just pretty middle-class suburbs. And for me to transition to New York, something like Astoria felt doable and sane, whereas Brooklyn and Manhattan just seemed like too much. I liked that you get all the benefits of New York City, but with a little more sanity. To this day, I love Queens and we live in Jackson Heights. We love it. I could have put it better myself. The charm of the city, but without the insanity. Do you think Astoria or New York in general still holds the potentiality for artists to be inspired, even with certain things such as, you know, overpopulation or congestion, or especially with the advent of the the last two years with things kind of being as crazy as they are, because I mean, I live on Long Island right now. So from an observer's point of view, I'm looking at it and I'm like, my God, I feel like I'm living the movie Death Wish right now. (laughs) I mean, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little... (laughs) Well, people who missed classic New York, they're getting a little taste of it again. You <laughs> yeah, know? well, you got it. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it because it's so weird because, you know, you know, Manhattan is like a giant billboard. You no longer have a lot of the grittiness of, let's say, the imagery of New York. But in the same time, some of the, the crime seems to be 
wildly out of control again and all sorts of things happening. I think back to like the 70s and how dangerous it was, but also how cheap the rents were downtown in Manhattan and how all this independent film, this gritty film came out of that and gritty art came out of that area. And I just don't know. I don't know where that would come from now. I mean, it's just so damn expensive in New York, the sort of starving artist type I don't know what they do now. I don't know how that works. I mean, I guess it's just five people in an apartment and they go out and shoot around the city or something. It's not that I don't have faith in the independent filmmakers in New York. I think New York has always had a tradition of doing more with less. I think in New York, people are pretty clever about using New York as a, as a backdrop and using that as their production design. Whereas LA has this reputation for sort of building everything on sound stages and then recreating environments. The reputation of New York cinema is authenticity. That's the reputation, I think. But uh, what I was saying is, I don't know, you know, maybe Detroit is the next place to do that kind of thing because artists can move there, live for very cheap in the city and, and make movies for nothing there. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'll always be Team New York, but it doesn't mean that other cities can't emerge and make their own film movement. You're right about that. I agree with you. When you see a film that has New York in the backdrop, the city itself kind of takes up space as like a living, breathing entity. There are so many moving parts that are going on that it adds to the film. You interview a slew of great talent for your film, including, as we mentioned, Professor James Richardson, Lloyd Kaufman himself, and the lovely Debbie Rashawn, each with their own story to tell. Hearing Debbie's story essentially seems to me like cancel culture at its worst. Just because she played a, I'm not going to say the word for fear of having the video taken down, but I'll just say code word Yahtzee. Right, right, right. Yeah. Doctor, prepare the throne for his arrival. Throne? We have a chair. I wasn't told anything about a throne of any kind. Um, how about a nice chaise lounge? It's much more comfy if you Shut ask it. me. Prepare the chair. She lost her job that she was working to fund her film, and I thought that was completely unfair. Do you think the context of art, specifically genre films and exploitation films, gets a negative reaction for all intents and purposes from Twitter mobs that pretty much have like no concept of context or intent? And yeah, do you it, think that hurts independent content creators? I think it can for sure. It's sort of like collateral damage, I think, because like if you're going to be so restrictive about what you dub to be acceptable if you narrow the perimeter of what is acceptable especially for artwork it puts you in a really dangerous situation because the edge of experimentation is the edge of acceptability so inherently if you're going to create new ground in film you're automatically going to be stretching outside of what is normally acceptable and that could be and with exploitation, typically you're talking about like taste, like, okay, we don't mind being crass, but we don't want you to be crass in this way. We, we don't mind being violent, but we don't want you to be violent in this way. I think Debbie said it well. She said something about how, you know, the, the, the studio films kind of get all the benefit. They get, they can play all the games and people like Debbie Rashawn, who has done over 300 films, they're the ones taking the risks at the edges of cinema that the studios then rip off. Like that's like the standard practice. So if one of Debbie Rochon's films, like Tromeo and Juliet, this huge independent film hit, if the studio system then wants to start making Shakespearean films with a contemporary edge, you know, all these people like Lloyd and Debbie, they've taken all the, the risks and um, they figured that out. And then the studio system goes ahead and just rips off their idea and makes it makes their next Shakespearean adaptation with modern elements. That's not to say Tromey and Juliet pioneered that, but just as an example, that is the role of, some believe, is the role of the artist to push push the edges. But if you're in a society that will literally destroy a human being for pushes the pushing the edges of cinema, how are they supposed to climb any ladder? I think it's damaging to art, and I think it has taken its toll. If you look at some of the mainstream cinema, no one likes anything, you know? I mean, it's it's all existing intellectual properties, and people are pissed off even hearing about the next Lord of the Rings series. They don't even want it, you know? I mean, I'll watch it, but <laughs> that's the way I feel about that. Debbie was straight up canceled, and it was by a mob of people who didn't want her working at the at the Y, essentially. That was the problem. Because she played 
a villain in a movie and frankly Inglorious Bastards, the, the, the guy who played the villain in Glorious Bastards won an Academy Award. Ding dong, motherfucker! Ding dong! And Debbie Rashawn gets fired. It's all hypocrisy, you know? It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and that's not taking anything away from Inglorious Bastards. I thought it was a great film. Yeah, I mean, great. I thought Christoph Waltz was great in that film. But you're right. If he can get an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, for the kind of character that he played. And Debbie loses her job because she played a similar, over, albeit over-the-top humorous character, not yeah. promoting it, but making fun of it. You're right, that is completely unfair. She's you a know, villain and she she's a villain and she gets killed. And there's justice, as she points out. It makes sense. It's not glorifying anything, you know? Anyway. No, of course not. What I was going to add to that, though, was the fact that her character gets justice at the end of the film. Whoever's watching it should be like, oh, OK, good or whatever. But, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> but I mean, at the same time, though, I can admit I've worked for two different conglomerates at different points in my life. I've worked for Viacom and I worked for NBC Universal. I can't even begin to tell you the amount of loopholes that they tried to look for to censor certain entities from either releasing their product or releasing any kind of information, almost like acting as though they had some kind of ownership over it. And that's what turned me off to working for major corporations like that. When I heard about Debbie's story, I'm not going to lie. I was heartbroken for her because she's provided decades of hilarious and fun entertainment and i think the world of her as an actress and i have never met her in my life but I, every movie that i've seen her in i've enjoyed i can't say i've seen a bad movie with debbie rashawn debbie if you're watching this keep up the good fight there's those of us that love you absolutely yeah yeah she's been a real friend and amazing producer i mean that's the thing people don't realize too if you have an independent film bring her on as a producer because she's great at it she may have access to resources or talent that you may not you know it's, there's a million reasons to hire her so not that she's looking i mean if you look at her imdb i think she's got like 10 films she's doing this year you know nonetheless she's great keep it up Deb. by the way there was one thing i wanted to piggyback on though yeah when amazon took down their list of genre films i was so pissed off and i almost wanted to cancel my membership but then i realized wait a minute i kind of purchased some films on amazon prime that i can't find anywhere else so free shipping yeah yeah you're stuck yeah 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 and i admit the main reason why i order disney plus because i grew up a nerd for star wars muppets and marvel even yeah. though I'm really not crazy and, and I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not a part of any fandom menace. I'm just saying right, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm just I, I, I'm not really keen on what they've done with Star Wars. I thought although I thought the Mandalorian was great. Muppets, they deserve more airtime and Marvel. Um, talk about beating a dead horse, but I digress. <laughs> Except for James Gunn. I mean, we all love Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, pretty much agree across the board. Yeah. But now my daughter loves the show Bluey. So I keep it for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I have like a two and a half year old and I'm going to have Disney Plus for at least the next 16, 17 years. So there you go. <laughs> I'm so glad for streaming services such as Troma Now and for yeah. Shudder because it gives us that chance to watch those films that we love that we really can't find anywhere else to consume them. What Troma's doing right now by including films such as Maniac Cop or The Exterminator with Robert Ginsey. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't need to go anywhere else. This is great. <laughs> they made some very smart moves. And that th that's the thing about Lloyd Kaufman and Michael Hurst. I don't think everyone knows is how smart those guys are um, because Lloyd presents himself as a sort of a P.T. Barnum character, you know, sort of celebrating exploitation cinema. But I mean, those guys are so smart. But yeah, they they acquired this North American Pictures catalog with all these films that seem like some of them are like action films like uh, McBain with Christopher Walken or uh, Dolph, uh, Red Scorpion with Dolph Lundgren. But that's right. They do yeah. have Red Scorpion. <laughs> yeah. I remember seeing commercials for that when it came out. Yeah, right. It, it, so but then they have like they acquired like basket case two and three and maniac cop and frank and hooker and all these titles where you're like 
man, that is so perfect. Like they're, they are so right for trauma. They fit in so well. Agreed. Um, but I was watching trauma. Now some of the stuff trauma edge TV and some of that stuff. I'm like, my God, I, I like no one was streamless. Some of the stuff on there. I don't, I don't know who, if trauma didn't do it. I mean, I know there's full moon has a streaming service. It is getting to a point where that type of stuff is like, Oh my God, like, I don't know who would stream this except an independent distributor, you know? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I have to admit it. Trauma is sort of like the mom and pop video rental store of the streaming age. Right. And I say that with the utmost respect. Yeah, like they're the ones who will have stuff that people just don't have the courage to want to explain. Like, why is this on your streaming service? Trauma's like, I don't care. We'll put it on. Shameless plug. You can find more films, including James's first documentary, VHS Massacre, on Trauma Now. All you have to do is just go to watch.trauma.com. Yes. And on top of that, first month is free. Every month after that is $4.99 a month. Seriously, it's a bargain, people. Go for it. Yeah, it's I. I I will say it's my it's one of my favorite streaming services. If I go on Troma now, I will absolutely watch something. Whereas all the other ones, Hulu and Disney and Netflix, I can roam around there for like 20 minutes and decide to watch nothing. If I go to Troma now, I will immediately watch something, you know? Definitely. Mutant Blast was amazing. I have to see that. I think it's still on. Streaming media and net neutrality huge talking points of the film. As we have been told by many artists whose music is available on Spotify. Streaming doesn't really afford the artist the luxury of paying the bills. Also, the monopolization of theaters by media conglomerates has made it impossible for independent filmmakers and distributors to get their films out. So from the time that The H Massacre 2 was created, because the first one had been out since 2016 already, and this film is an answer to it. Has there been any improvement in how people can receive new films by new directors that you've witnessed? I think so. I think there's a few standout streaming services that have really made a go of it. Actually, you know, in in talking about Trauma Now, how they acquired that new catalog, they have like, it's close to a thousand films. They're actually in a position, I mean, look, they're not gonna be like prime, but their catalog is deep enough where it can actually be a venue for uh, independent filmmakers to get their films out to the right audience. I mean, that's one of the things that Troma has done for me personally, is if I just made these VHS Massacre movies without Troma putting them out, I don't think they would have done as well as they, they have. I think if you're in line with what Troma is doing and your movie fits within what you know what they can put out or what they want to put out then you to some degree have access to their fan base and so i do think that independent filmmakers have found a few places to rally and also there is this weird thing that has happened with dvd and blu-ray in the last year or two more people want to buy physical media and i think you can chalk it up to how ridiculous some of the streaming sites are behaving with how greedy they're getting with their contracts about this movie will be available on netflix for this six months and then it rotates off and then it pops up on prime and you could never ever find the movie that you want to watch for for the on the streaming site where you're paying for you almost always have to pay an extra five, 10 bucks to watch it. And I think people are sick of it. So I think physical media, hopefully, if things keep going the way they are, can be the way that independent filmmakers might have success. Joe Bob Briggs talks about independent filmmakers giving their movies away too easily and too quickly and doing things like hitting the festival circuit, even if that's streaming, then having a window of maybe six months to a year where it's only physical media. This is the only way you can see it. It's not available anywhere. And then after that, trying to get some pennies on the dollar for streaming. So I think that's part of it. And then also brand building, like what you're doing with your podcast, like what I'm trying to do with VHS Massacre, this concept of branding, building a whole brand around it, you know? So VHS Massacre, it's the, it's the movies, it's the podcast and trying to develop a, uh, a valuable brand that people can go to. So, I mean, 
I don't know. That's that's what I found out. And the truth is, I don't have all the answers. I think I'm stalled a little bit in where the independent filmmakers are going to find a way around the distributors. So, uh, I, you know, we all got to just keep looking for it and see see what people are doing and what works. By the way, congratulations on VHS Massacre 2 being the number three most purchased documentary Blu-ray DVD release. Congratulations on that. I saw that and I was like, way to go. Thanks, man. Yeah. No, I didn't expect that. I mean, that, that was awesome. I'm really happy that people noticed. I mean, if anything, it should give you reassurance that what you're doing is striking a nerve with people. Because, I mean, to be number three, uh, that's that's not an easy feat and that's nothing to laugh at. Absolutely not. No, I'm yeah, I mean, I'm I'm delighted, but it's all trauma. Trauma has enough uh, fan base for it to have a chance, you know, so you're right. No we guarantee mentioned- of anything. Yeah. You're right. But we did mention brand recognition. I did mention this in our conversation off camera and I'll bring it up. As difficult as it is for a lot of independent creators to make it to the point of being seen by a major to get distribution or to be acknowledged. I think personally, people like us, you know, people such as the ones that you've interviewed, I think we're living in a a new frontier of content consumption because everyone has kind of adopted the punk rock ethos of DIY, do it yourself, where Some people know filmmaking, some people know acting, some people know how to make special effects on the cheap. Other people know marketing, other people know search engine optimizations, uh, SEO. They know about website building. I think it's getting to a point where people eventually will get to the point where they'll sort of meet like-minded individuals and kind of come together for the sole purpose of not striking while the iron is hot, but doing something that is going to, well, if we're lucky, and this is nothing against people who work for the majors, but it's just their corporate structure that I'm not too crazy about, put them to shame and say, hey, this was made in some guy's basement and it looks better than the crap fest you're putting a $15 million marketing strategy behind. You know, I I, I genuinely think that. And I don't know if that's me being naive or optimistic, but, you know, I, I've interviewed a lot of people on this podcast who are all doing it themselves, whether it's writing their music, recording their music, producing their music, releasing their music, self-publishing their books. I think I see a bright future for us. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, we're, I think we're finding a way around the studio system now and we'll continue to do it. But I, I think you're right. The more lame and tired the mainstream content is, the, the be- more opportunity we have. If they have to make some Frankenstein project that ha- has to somehow not offend or please the entire world, it, it's typically going to be a pretty homogenized pile of crap. In some ways, the media conglomerates and their need to appease millions and millions is probably the the best thing for us because we don't have to do that, right? We can find half a million people that really dig our stuff and and that would be fine, you know? And, And I remember John Carpenter saying that, you know, he probably thought he only had about a half a million loyal fans that would buy his movies and, and do all that stuff. And that was his core. And then there were the casual fans as well. And that sort of added up to his wildly successful career. Yeah, we don't we don't need to make everyone happy. <laughs> it's not our aim. That was never the purpose of genre films or exploitation films to begin with. It was made for anyone to consume it. But the ones that it gravitated towards, they got it. And they bought it. Guys like me, we we love it to this day. And speaking of John Carpenter, oh my God, Escape from New York. I'll take that film over what they try to pass as sci-fi today, any day. And yeah. it it looks so gritty. There was a period in my life where I was only watching films from the early 80s. So I was watching Escape from New York and I was also watching a lot of the Italian exploitation films that came out in its wake, like Escape from the Bronx or Warriors yeah. of the Lost World. Yes. And I got to give it up to Italian filmmakers because these were master craftspeople who did 
such great stuff. And they weren't in a union. They barely had budgets. But talk about marketing campaigns. That was some of the best artwork that oh, I've yeah. ever seen for cinema. So, yeah, ciao was, Italia. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I forget all three of the titles. But, yeah, it was like Ken Powell found... It was like three Italian made New York apocalypse film. It was like Bronx Warrior. And then what was the one you mentioned? I think it was like Escape from the Bronx. You're right. But the Bronx Warriors was sort of like a combo of Mad Max meets the Warriors meets Escape from New York. Escape from the Bronx was a sequel to that. Oh, okay. Okay. Funny that there is like more than just a couple of them. Like there's at least, I think, three Italian movies about post-apocalyptic new york or apocalyptic new york that was like that's that's pretty amazing yeah i don't know if you could beat bruno Mattei's rats nights of terror it was an <laughs> apocalyptic film where apparently the world has been destroyed by rats and you have a few survivors of humans but there weren't even rats in the film it was gerbils <laughs> they painted black and awesome. i was like god i hope they didn't kill the gerbils you know I mean, <laughs> pro animal welfare but that, that sounds amazing <laughs> uh, have you have to watch it once that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> so you mentioned before you also host the vhs massacres podcast of which i'm a very proud subscriber and oh, i also follow the youtube channel as well just so you know the vhs massacres podcast is available on all streaming audio platforms how has the podcast been in terms of garnering interest in not just your current film but all the films you've done in the past and is it something that you would like to use to further elevate not just your films but others as well oh yeah i i mean we it used to be called new york cine c-i-n-e that's clever it was, it was like that i thought it was good everyone was like what's new york sign i don't know oh, for god's sakes culture yourself people yeah i mean i thought it was kind of cool so it was like that for years and it in its height there was one month where fifty thousand people listened to it that month on podbean and stitcher we got to that height and then it was a slow decline and one of my friends married and moved away and it it basically just kind of fizzled for a while. And then that's when I decided to, and mind you, in the in the first VHS Massacre, the podcast is referenced still as New York City. It did pretty well in that era. But at a certain point, VHS Massacre was actually doing pretty well and people were starting to recognize it. And so I rebranded it VHS Massacre Radio instead of New York City. And then it was more of a way to just talk here and there about the state of independent film or if, if new things were going on with my films. So it definitely was on life support. If you go back a year or two ago, it's pretty sparse. I would do like a show a month or something just to keep it going. But then, you know, the last few months it's gained some steam and I've interviewed some people like Jason Carvey, who I grew up with. That was the gentleman who released the film with John Krasinski, correct? Before The Office took off. Yeah. And his new film, Till Death, is actually a lot of fun. It's a Megan Fox film. It's a really fun horror thriller, believe it or not. It's a really amazing little film. And that was Millennium Pictures. So I think I'd done about four or five little interviews. I interviewed John Brennan from Last Drive-In. Hey, John. Hello. A few other people. So I've, I've rallied a little bit, but I have to admit that the podcast was more focused on either I'd find interesting topics to talk about or it would be some news happened with the various projects. And it just had been, I think, it's essentially been running for a decade. It definitely ebbs and flows in regard to how much effort I can put into it. I do enjoy doing new interviews, but I have like a, a two and a half year old and it's very hard for me to get spare time. You know? My brother, I have a three and a half year old. I feel your pain. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> what am I in store for? Right. What? A, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Threes are worse. <laughs> oh, Just no. remember that. No, no. Start the potty training now. <laughs> That's funny, but I, I still do it. I still like it. Um, yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll catch a catch a third wind and and start doing a bunch of interviews again. I love the format. I love the power of podcasting. I believe in it hundred percent. I don't review movies as much as I used to. I just feel like there's other people that do it better. I'll try to do just more of the industry where I feel I can offer new information you know It's amazing though how much podcasts some people cite them as a source of entertainment. I mean, I know for us, for, for Music is Live podcast and Rats Eye Review, it's entertainment. Others, people use it as a source, not for information, but for discussion, for discourse. One of the biggest podcasts out there right now, I won't say the name, but I will say that the 
initials are JRE, has right. gone under a lot of scrutiny to a point where kind of like the way the major communication conglomerates sort of put the hammer down on independence. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of afraid that a lot of the major news companies are even going to try to crack down on podcasts completely, again, missing the point of context and intent. I think what we do, you and I in particular, is we're providing a service of entertainment and information for people to be able to consume things that are not within the norm or not within the spectrum of what's in the mainstream. I remember when I first started Music is Life, my whole thing was I wanted to be a disruptor to the mainstream. It's not that I'm against mainstream stuff. It's just, I think that there's so much great stuff out there that needs to be talked about that no one knows about. It's a great point. I mean, and Lloyd, I interviewed Lloyd, I guess it was a year ago. Lloyd brought up, there's no financial motive to talk about some Italian horror film that was about, you know, based in the Bronx, supposed to be based in the Bronx, you know? So if, if you're, you know, we're bringing to like these, these older films that have come out, you know, we're, we're doing it because we love the films and because, you know, maybe we're fans of, of the genre or whatever, but someone like uh, some major conglomerate, there's no, there's no motivation to do it. They're not going to, they're not going to make money off of that, 20 year old dvd that someone buys use off of amazon because they because you reviewed it I think right but at the same time they don't mind taking a clip from zombie where the zombie's fighting a shark and using it to sell a television you know i mean right yeah good point good point yeah i think podcasts are very important you bring up one of the more prominent podcasters there's the old marshall McLuhan theory on media and it refers to what a form of media does is more important than any individual content content on it. If you look at what podcasting does for media, that is far more important as a movement than any individual show. And so that that is something that needs to be protected and, and free and uncensored and all that stuff. And particularly because there are only five or six media conglomerates that absolutely control the message. Um, their control of the message is based upon, I suppose, commerce what choices people are making but more and more there seems to be unnecessary censorship and so podcasts become incredibly important to a free society i studied some communication and you know one of the things that you learn is when news media had to suddenly turn a profit to some degree was the beginning of the end in the early days of television you basically had three networks and they were given the ability to monopolize the airways on the condition that they would, they would give news. That was the condition. Okay, you have to give quality news, objective news, the best you can do. And that is, your, that is the price to pay for getting the airways where you can put any show you want on there. And so they did that for a while. And at some point in history, they just decided, no, news has to make a profit. And so once television news needed to make a profit, it just got worse and worse and worse. And now if you look at something like CNN, most of their revenue comes from pharmaceutical commercials, you know? <laughs> and I think Lloyd talks about this in his new film, Hashtag yeah. Shakespeare Shitstorm. Yeah. Look how many boner pill commercials there are on CNN during the breaks. It's no wonder that they have a problem with anyone who says anything out of the norm. It doesn't surprise me. Personally, I just think that people really are smart enough to be able to think for themselves and find the information out for themselves. It's just, you know, them doing their effort to do it. And, you know, that goes for anything to be consumed, whether it's information or news or good films. And again, I will say that, I mean, I know we're only at the beginning of 2022, but you know, I'll go so far as to say this is one of the best documentaries that I've ever seen. And I feel like it tops what the first one did. The first one made me a fan. This one made me a believer. Have you seen the light? Yes! Yes! Jesus H. God damn it, Christ! I have seen the light! Thanks so much, man. That's the that's the one of the nicest things anyone's ever said about 
any of my films and i've done some pretty ridiculous ones <laughs> but <laughs> well, yeah man, i will I i'm gonna make my effort to check them out and if i have any questions now i know how to get in contact with you so you had joe bob briggs as one of the focal points of both films and you got him right before shutter released the last drive-in where he was talking about not knowing if he ever was going to go back to television again and then boom four seasons later the last drive-in is still going on and you have graduates from trauma you have matt mandarides you have uh, John Brennan and you have uh, Justin Martell along with Diana Prince as Darcy the male girl working with Joe Bob. When you look back on it, what do you think about that? Pretty lucky, I guess. I was pretty happy about it. I was I was always, like you, I'm sure, was always a fan of Joe Bob. Almost all of his shows, right? From I will admit the- I was not a fan of Monster Vision because okay. my kind of horror, I was looking for the more visceral growing up and tnt yeah. there was only so much you could get away with was it Cin- cinema no showtime right his first show or was it cinema i think it was the movie channel but that movie was channel. in the early to mid 90s and we didn't have movie channel in our house growing up we had usa up all night which is uh, okay, you yeah. know how yeah, i got free ron yeah i had um, <laughs> i didn't who, have I who didn't... better who better to introduce toxic avenger on a friday night than gilbert godfrey <laughs> gilbert godfrey <laughs> Yeah, one friend I had had all the cable channels because he had like five older brothers and they all lived in the same house. And so they had all the cable channels. And so I would watch Joe Bob's uh, show and then and Monster Vision I would watch here and there. But I kind of agree that the the, it was more extreme stuff on, uh, you know, his first show. But, you know, when we were able to contact and interview him, he's always written. He's always been uh, he's he's put out books and he's a. always writing articles under his real name john bloom yes yeah john bloom and he's he's this closet genius by the way who gives google talks in his spare times his tv career was totally in a lull he didn't he didn't have anything going on i I would only find out later they were trying to do the last drive-in but um that didn't happen till a a long time after i think it was thanksgiving 2018 uh, when they revived it with that 10 movie marathon yeah we interviewed yeah we interviewed joe bob just once and we interviewed him uh and those interviews we were able to use those in part one and part two it's a normal thing that you'd want to talk to joe bob about hey would you ever do a, a show again but uh we had no clue that he, he would he would come back and be bigger than he ever was you know um it, and so it was, it was really fortunate um but you can say we caught him at a time where he just didn't have that much going on. So, and, and we, we got him cause we were huge fans of him. Um, it wasn't that he was on some upswing and we were, we were getting him on the way up. He just, he was like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. But he was wearing the cowboy uh, button down with the bolo tie. So, he, yeah. I, you know, something oh, no, me- he, yeah, he was still full on Joe Bob and, and my God, he is uh they call him like a one take wonder he's incredible there's very few ums and ahs and almost everything that comes out of his mouth Mm -hmm. is either hilarious or in-depth knowledge i mean he really is like one of a kind i mean there's really no one quite like him Um, definitely not person you know it's so crazy definitely not and, and thank goodness for people like him and zenguli who you know they do their own horror shows in their local areas for me i love it when people bring the fun back to the cinematic experience yeah. you know yeah, yeah. and i think that's just what's missing now it's like i i just miss having fun you know yeah. I, I, and as, as much as this film did make me think vhs massacre 2 and and the first one they were just fun to watch because of the information and research you did. I have to admit when, when that clip from we sings was in, I was <laughs> freaked out, but I thought it was hilarious at the same time. Oh my God. Yeah. Ken found that we, we found like the best stuff was at that Goodwill, Goodwill Long Island city on Van Dam street. I forget the crossroad. I mean, we found like, three or four of those tapes like that day you never know what you're going to find i think about that i think about the vhs hunts that we went on it's a warm nostalgic feeling when things get a little more normal i'd like to do it again go to the 
pick around, pick around New York, see what's still there. It'll probably be mostly thrift stores at this point, I would imagine. Probably. But again, I'm glad that on Steinway Street in Astoria, there's still some thrift stores where you could find some hidden gems there. For nostalgia purposes, I'll always look back on my time growing up in Astoria as the best freaking time that I could have ever had. I miss the UA Theater that is now the Dwayne Reed on the corner of Steinway and 30th. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that was the best part of the, you can, you can kind of see it. It used to be something like a theater, right? It, it did. Still, it still has the old marquee there that they just yeah. put, you know, like Walgreens or Dwayne Reed on top of it. <laughs> right, but, right. you know, I mean, that's where I first saw uh, Gremlins and Ghostbusters. That's where my brothers first saw Toxic Avenger. You know, oh, it was wow. at that theater. And, and, and I don't think being nostalgic for that time is a bad thing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your background right now, the Kim's video on uh, up, up ground and underground. You know, that was a wonderful time for me, you know, hanging out in St. Mark's Place with my friends, you know, going to check our friends bands out at the Continental, then going to the video store to check out stuff. And, you know, I, I just think it's uh, it's a shame that, um, well, people don't have that. But with every change in society comes adaptation. So. Eventually, I'm sure that the search for new independent content creators, it will thrive again. And when the next technological change comes up, there'll be a lull, but they'll thrive once more. It's like I tell people, if you believe in what you're doing, just keep putting it out there. You know, get a full time job and do what you love to do and put it out there. And if it takes good stuff, if not. At least you can look back and say, hey, I'm proud of what I did. But I would like to see an era where independent content creators can capitalize off their hard work and talent again. But I don't think we're too far off, in my opinion. I do feel like something has to give. I don't worry for the first time filmmaker. There's always going to be that person who says, I'm going to take the plunge. I'm going to make a feature length film, take years to do it. or try my hardest and I'm going to really go for it. I don't really worry. We're always going to have that as long as people still watch feature length films. What I worry about is the person who wants it as a career. Like they, they want it to be an independent filmmaker. So they're trying to make their second or their third and they're just totally fucked because they signed a bad deal with a, a studio or there's just no money to be had. And there's always a risk of that. I got spoiled by the late 90s movement where people could make some dough, you know, and, and uh, have a living on it. But I suppose by the time I got any good at filmmaking, that had already <laughs> run its course where there's just far less money in it i don't think you were spoiled i uh, i i gave yourself a little a, a lot more credit than that i was a student at st john's university in 1998 part of why i went there was because i wanted to see if i can work in the television or film industry um, as i mentioned to john my first internship was trauma in the summer of 98 i was an intern on terra firmer in pre-production I didn't last during production because when Lloyd stated, you know, we're going to be shooting in Brooklyn in Greenpoint, Brooklyn every day for the month of August. And you have to be here at this time. And this is the time we end. And I said, you know what? I don't think I'm cut out for this. So I, I knew at the time that I couldn't commit that desire was still there. And I know for a lot of us that went into film or television, there's still that desire there. I mean, th the thing is, even with the limitations set upon us by, you know, the major distributors and the major theater chains, there's still going to be a, a, a need for that. So I look at it this way, you know, Lloyd's got make your own damn movie, direct your own damn movie, you know, produce your own damn movie, sell your own damn movie. He's got all those books. It would help independent filmmakers, I think, to learn all facets of that. This way, it's like, you know, they can work on their own stuff. And, and like I said, with the whole joining up with other like-minded people, help them where they may need help and hopefully have that reciprocate and then one large community come out of that. I feel it's still possible. And I don't care if I'm a naive fool for saying that. No, I, I think the appetite is starting to grow again for independent film because of the restraints on mainstream content. 
I think it's going to sort of bust through at a, a certain point. I, I, I do believe that. In regard to the craft of filmmaking, kind of on what you were saying about various skill sets, I got to a point where, especially with the documentaries, I just didn't want to be beholden to anyone in regard to being able to finish the project and even when i you know i occasionally teach a video production class and when i do that i teach it as a one-man band sort of thing like i, I do think you should be able to if if you if you want to make films learn to shoot learn to cut learn to do audio learn to write the best you can because it's the only way to be unstoppable and that's the only way to complete things and and it's come in handy i agree with that statement career. You know, yeah. So I just, it's the, it's the only way to be a hundred. I mean, nothing's a hundred percent, but it's, it's, it's the only way to ensure that you could finish. I've had film sets where DPs have just said at 6 PM, I'm going home and I'm like, fine. And then I started operating the camera myself and ended up shooting a bunch of stuff by myself. And I was so used to doing it. It wasn't a huge deal. You know, I've had people bail on me. I've had to rewrite entire scripts because they've uh, actors just they're like, ah, I, I don't want to do this anymore. So, I mean, it, it's it's tough, you know. All right. No so gonna... I'm, I'm going to throw my name into the hat then. If you ever need help on a weekend shoot. OK, sure. I'd help you out for no money. OK, awesome. Yeah, I'll let you know. I was trying to come up with the next project and the, I've had a bunch of false starts and I've come to realize that's fine. Totally fine to have false starts. But when I settle on something, yeah, I mean, sure. I'll, you know, I'd love to help. No problem. But like I said, I'm a full time daddy and I'll be full time working again soon. So, uh, oh man, yeah, you don't have to tell me. It's, uh, <laughs> a lot it's a lot but uh you know i mean i i I just think it's fun and and i I love what you do and i believe in what you're doing and i can't even begin to tell you how honored i am to have you on music is life podcast the way it worked out it was like i watched the first film then i bought the second film and then i was like i gotta message this dude and (laughs) you immediately hit me back up and and you were like hey i'm available today i'm like boom let's do it i'm telling you (laughs) let's do it yeah I yeah. thought of these questions the moment he said, yes, I'm available at this time. So that was about an hour and a half window. I hope the questions were good. <laughs> no, th- this was amazing, man. No, I really appreciate it. And, and it, it's, it just goes to show you, you're in, we're both in full dad mode. And dad mode is like, I, I have two hours. I can do this. You know, it, it's like, <laughs> I can do this right now. But because when, because when I come home, it, when I go home, it's, it's, it's all, uh, it's all family stuff, you know? So it's like, yeah, uh, you know, squeeze in stuff where you can, you know, that's just it's like my, fa- it's like my favorite line from the film Dolomite. Tell me has 24 hours and 23 of them are already up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tom, if people want to find out more about you, VHS Massacre, the film series and VHS Massacres, the podcast, where could people find out more? Um, the easiest place to go is VHSmassacre.com. Then I'm on all the most of the major uh, social media websites under the handle VHS Masker. Um, I try to communicate through the pod, the podcast, and the and the YouTube with any updates. So yeah, you can hit me up there, and yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Links will be in the description below, plus a link to purchase VHS Massacres one and two directly. Check those films out where you can. Find out everything you need to know about Tom. Support this guy. He's busting his ass. He's got a kid. Okay, <laughs> all right forget disney help this guy out (laughs) they'll be fine they got bluey okay (laughs) tom seymour i cannot thank you enough thanks for coming on to music is live podcast this was a blast wonderful uh wonderful uh talking with you and uh yeah reach out to me anytime man will do are you going to be at the uh hashtag shakespeare shitstorm premiere at the museum of moving image yeah i do want to go to that is that um when's that coming up is that next month no april 8th uh, at, at Astoria Queens at the Museum of the Moving Image. I'm going to try to go there too. Yeah, I got to pre I got to pre buy some tickets. I don't know if they're available. Yeah, I'm yet. looking for the link. I can't find it. <laughs> I, I couldn't find it either. Yeah. yeah. Lloyd, help I, us out here. Yeah. <laughs> I am planning on it, though. Yeah, for sure. Good stuff. To find out more about the Music is Live podcast, check us out over at musicislivepodcast.com. Also, check out our parent network, Radstyle Review, over at radstylereview.com. And I'm very happy to say that coming up soon, uh, you'll be hearing me on our 80s film podcast, Just the Cheese, Please, with Tara J and Adam where we discuss my favorite trauma film, The Toxic Avenger. You want to talk about cheese? 
this is the extra cheese pizza you're waiting for, people. I'm telling you. Thanks for watching or listening to Music is Live podcast. Tom Seymour, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. And remember, all art is valid. Cheers. God bless us, everyone. This was a great documentary, and I hope to have... Oh, wait. <laughs> I actually wrote a review for your film before I knew you were coming on. So... Oh, really? <laughs> oh, cool. I'm honored. Spoiler alert. <laughs> All right, so let me take that again.